Welcome back to another uh, fireside chat. Sorry about the way I look. I uh, haven't had a chance to get a haircut for a little while and I'm not sure I'm ready to have my wife do it. So this is as good as it gets. Just wanted to show you my uh, coronavirus folder. There it is. It's getting big and I got some more things to add to it today as well. You know, over there in Finlay, I got word that starting May 17th, they're going to uh, they're going to allow churches to make a step towards coming back together again. Our bishop is recommending that we not do any of that until a little bit later, maybe even the start of June. I took a look at uh, what's going to be required of them over there in Finlay if they, they do. You know, we we have our, our synod has put together a task force called the Parish Plan for Return. And we've gotten some information from them, things to think about. You know, I was just, uh, I was just looking at all those things that uh, over there in Finley, where is it? Oh yeah, here it is. Here's what they're saying if you come back to worship, that they were going to encourage the at-risk population to stay at home, watch, participate remotely. They're going to limit attendance to 50% of the fire code capacity, equip ushers and greeters with gloves and masks, discourage handshaking, no Sunday school or child care, sanitizers, at the door for communal use, clean and disinfect the high touch areas before and after church, no communal food, no coffee and donuts. You gotta be kidding me. Request all attendees wear face coverings. Uh, have attendees check temperatures and not attend if they're showing any symptoms. Post signs on the door, encourage social distancing, encourage families to sit together, stay together, cover all the drinking fountains, post signs about good hygiene in the bathrooms and make sure the bathrooms are properly stocked with soap and paper towels for proper hand washing, just to name a few. Wow. And our bishop and that team of people, they, they threw out all kinds of questions. They didn't give a lot of answers, but things that we're going to have to start thinking about. Things are going to be different. Oops. Sorry about that, Bob and Mary. Didn't mean to knock you off your seat. <laughs> yeah, things are going to be different. You know, I remember about, uh, <clears throat> well, it's coming up on 20 years ago now. I had this, uh, this little open heart surgery. I won't go into all the details, but, but I had a leaky aortic valve and um, had to go under the knife to fix it and they actually fortunately repaired it. But, but I got this uh, about four or five inch incision right there in my chest uh, from that surgery and uh, I remember I remember the recovery from that was was long. I mean, just moving was really, really hard, and and then it didn't seem like the incision was healing like it should, and, and that was taking some more time. Uh, it was just even painful to roll out of bed in the morning. I remember I was told to do lots of walking. I remember all the things that I couldn't do. They didn't want me mowing the lawn right away. They didn't want me swinging a golf club. They, they didn't want me overexerting myself. And then I had to go to these physical 
uh, cardiac rehab things and they kept having me do this sort of thing to test and make sure everything was functioning right with the heart. It was, it was a number of months. And then there were some things that, you know, I just couldn't, or they didn't want me to do ever again. I remember uh, asking them about running and they said, no, don't want me doing that. Of course, it wasn't because of my heart, it was because they said, well, it wasn't good for your joints. It's kind of when I got back into bike riding quite a bit, but uh, it's the kind of thing that you know is going to change some things about you when you go through something like that. And there are some things about my life that are totally different, having had that open heart surgery. I mean, I'm getting along fine. Health is pretty good. But it definitely changes things, even though it was 20 years ago. I was thinking about all this COVID-19 stuff. It's, uh, and just even hearing what they're gonna try to do as far as worship and church goes in Finley. Um, and you can, you can bet your bottom dollar, uh, there's gonna be some things going on differently here too, and all across the country, um, it's it's changing things, and and I'm confident, faithful, and I hope you are too. That you know God's gonna gonna see us through this, and and I think it's 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 always a good thing for us to remember as we journey through this time of uh, that. It, you know, we're not operating, you know, singularly. Um, we're not operating just for our own personal sake. Um, I think it's important for us to know what's driving all of these kind of things for us. Now for the world and for our country and for our state, you know, they, they got health and the well-being of people and the avoidance of cases and deaths from COVID-19. That's, that's what's driving it, you know, along with, you know, issues of finances and money and all that kind of stuff too. But I'd like to think that having received all the information that we continue to receive at what's driving our behavior even as we consider coming back to worship in some form what's what's driving our behavior first and foremost even as we listen into to our authorities is is that second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. I, I did a little search of, of that and and while it, it, it doesn't show up all that many times in the Bible, uh, two, four, six, eight, nine times, it is still pretty compelling to to take a look at what it is that we acknowledge, accept, um, maybe even own about loving the neighbor. <clears throat> it all started out in Leviticus 19.18 where the Lord God said to Moses to say to the people, you know, they're wandering in the wilderness, to love your neighbor as yourself. Then you got to wait all the way to the New Testament for it to be officially repeated in the scriptures. But Jesus says it to the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. He says it to the rich young man. He says it to a lawyer or Pharisee. Uh, he says it to a scribe one time. Um, one time there was actually a lawyer to Jesus uh, who said, 
you know, to love your neighbor as yourself. But uh, out of that, Jesus then went and told the parable of the Good Samaritan because the question of who my neighbor was was at issue. And then Paul wrote about it. Uh, Interestingly enough, when he wrote to the Romans, the church in Rome, he said, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. But right before he said that in chapter 13, he said, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. And then shortly after that, he said, you know, the whole law is summed up in this love your neighbor as yourself. Right after he spoke about the importance of being subject to the governing authorities. And then Paul to the Galatians, uh, he, he said that the whole law was summed up in these words, love your neighbor as yourself. And then finally in James, um, he talked about it as the royal law according to the scriptures this was the royal law to, to love your neighbor as yourself now I know we're, we're all in some way shape or form trying to discover what it really means to love our neighbor just in general but I'm I'm pretty sure that some of these Precautions, all of these precautions, I suppose, that we, we may be taking part in are about ultimately, as followers of Jesus, are about how it is that we might fulfill that royal law or how all of the commandments are summed up in the phrase love your neighbor as yourself it isn't going to be easy when we start to get back but then again loving one's neighbor isn't always easy either under any circumstances Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay praying, and stay believing, my friends, and, and Christ be with you.